Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name's Cole Anderson. So today we're talking about Schubert's G-flat impromptu from his Opus 90 set. This is one of Schubert's most memorable pieces. It's quite a famous piece, I think, and oft attempted by amateurs at all levels. We've gotten so used to this piece, I guess, that we oftentimes don't realize how remarkable it really is, though, and how many striking features there are in the composition. As was usual for Schubert, in this piece, he really attained a very unique kind of sound world. And this was a remarkable thing about Schubert's piano writing. Obviously, Schubert himself was not a virtuoso pianist. He had such difficulty playing his own most difficult works that he did things like make simpler arrangements of his song, his famous song, the Earl Koenig, in order to simplify the difficulty of the repeated notes and he supposedly was completely unable to play his famous Wanderer fantasy, even stopping in the middle and saying that the devil could play it, but that he could not. Despite this drawback in the technical side of his piano playing, or perhaps because of it, he oftentimes found strikingly original piano textures and sounds, and that's exactly the case in this piece. The texture that Schubert comes up here with the right hand playing both the melody and filling in these kind of feathery light, diaphanous accompaniment figures, is the sort of thing that a native pianist might not have thought of because it's actually quite awkward to play well. It's difficult to keep a good balance between the accompaniment and the melody while still shaping the melody in a natural singing way. Nonetheless, the final sound effect is very arresting and marvelous. And of course, the piece is also written in a very unusual way key signature for the for the day G flat major or six flats and this actually disturbed the first publisher of the work so much that they actually transcribed it into G major to make it more palatable to purchasers of the music this was in 1857 a good 30 years after it was composed well after Schubert's death and this version in G major was the only one known for quite some time when Liszt made an edition of the work a few years later. He also kept the piece in G major and made a few alterations of his own to this piece and also the Opus 90 number no. two impromptu. And those alterations are kind of interesting. They make sense. Liszt filled out some of the textures in the Opus 90 number no. two impromptu. And in this G flat impromptu, he has a section where he tr actually transposes the right hand up an octave and kind of fills out the left hand with these arpeggios in order to kind of expand the texture and vary the sound. It's quite interesting, but I think it kind of detracts from this rapt, almost religious mood in the original and kind of trivializes the music a little bit. Still, worth looking into if you're interested in doing an alternative version of this piece, since I've never heard anyone play it before, and it is actually quite interesting. Of course, transposing the piece into G major makes a lot of problems. One of the problems, of course, is that Schubert had a key scheme in mind when he wrote these impromptus. So all of the impromptus, all eight in fact, both in the Opus 90 set and in the Opus 142 set are in some kind of flat key signature. And it's not certain if Schubert really intended these impromptus to be played as a set. Certainly they're very effective if they're played alone, and they can be played as a set. People do that sometimes. The Opus 90 set of impromptus might be less effective just because there's a little bit of an odd uh, journey that the pieces go through, ending in the A-flat major minor impromptu, which is a fairly understated piece to end such a long group of pieces. But the second set actually kind of resembles a kind of almost a sonata in four movements and is very effective played altogether. But whether or not Schubert meant these pieces to be played as a set, there definitely was this connection that the pieces are in all in flat keys, and there are also some melodic correspondences between the pieces. I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're motivically interrelated necessarily, but there are some things about the melodic material that's actually quite closely related among these pieces. Another thing that the initial editor of this piece did was to change the time signature also. Schubert has a very idiosyncratic time signature that he uses, double cut time. So basically what this equals is four two, four half notes to a bar. So why does Schubert do this? And why in fact do composers actually use this indication for cut time 
anyway? What is it all about? A lot of times beginning students are confused by this because when you have an ordinary bar of common time, four quarter notes in a bar, and then when you see cut time, which is two half notes to a bar, it's the same, isn't it? It's four quarter notes. What's the difference? Well, the difference is kind of a subtle thing. If you are feeling four beats to a measure as compared to two beats to a measure, you're gonna end up playing the piece in a different way. When you're only feeling two big beats instead of four little beats, your big beats, even though they're slower beats, you're probably going to feel like you're playing in a more flowing, faster tempo. That's almost always the result. And that's really what composers were going for when they used these indications. It was supposed to suggest that the tempo was more flowing, a little bit faster perhaps, and that the performer should be feeling the music in larger groups. And so that's really what Schubert is looking for here. He writes this piece in note values that he thinks will discourage the performer from playing too rapidly, but at the same time, using this double cut time time signature, he's encouraging the pianist to play with a very long line and not too slowly. And I think that if you play the version of G major with the 4-4 four, four time signature, you end up playing in a little bit more of a stodgy way. Now, transposing the piece into G major has other problems, of course, as well. First off, uh, it's actually more comfortable to play this piece and many others in keys that have lots of sharps and flats. And oftentimes my students are confused by this actually because they think that it's more difficult to play when there's more sharps and flats because it's more confusing at first if you're not familiar with playing in any key. But if you just think about physically how it feels to play the piano, actually the black keys are very comfortable. It's much easier to be accurate on the black keys and your hands can kind of relax into a more extended natural shape instead of having to have this kind of very curved position of the fingers, which is necessary when you're playing on a lot of white keys. This is the reason that Chopin always taught his students to play in the key of B major first because it's the most comfortable scale to play. The long fingers all fall on black keys. This is also precisely the reason that Carl Tausig, when he made his transcription of Schubert's military march in D major for one piano, four hands, he transcribed it for solo piano, two hands, he transposed it into D flat major for exactly this reason, because later in the piece he has a section where there are long jumps in the left hand, and they're far easier to hit if you're jumping to black keys instead of to white keys. There may also have been a consideration of tuning in Schubert's choice of keys. So if we assume that he was writing for an instrument that would have been tuned in a non-equal temperament, then G flat major would have had a very different character from a more commonly used key like G major or C major. It would have had a little bit of a kind of almost exotic flavor to it because it would have been a little bit more out of tune than the more common keys. So anyway, uh, I hope you do enjoy this performance of the piece. If it's your first time hearing the piece, then you are lucky. I hope that you come to love this piece as much as I do. If you've heard this piece many times before, I can only hope that my performance will perhaps give you some new ideas about it and revive your enthusiasm for this work. So please enjoy the performance, and until next time.